thanks for tuning in once again to the Explaining History podcast. And today I want to talk about the class tensions and violence that existed in Spain in the two decades before the Spanish Civil War begins in 1936. Because these uh, tensions help us to understand the causes of the Civil War in much greater context. And they, they help us to understand really the the politics of um, kind of a revolutionary era in Spain. And we can also see them in a wider European context. Spain is uh, interesting in that uh, where we start our journey in 1918 in Spain, uh, Spain had obviously not been a participant in the First World War, but the, um, the tensions, the political tensions and crises and social crises generated by the war, um, Spain was not insulated from. 1918 is a year of political violence and revolution across Europe. Uh, in 1917, obviously, the uh, Bolsheviks had seized power in October in Russia. At the end of the First World War, there is a revolution in Germany. There are revolutionary uprisings in Italy. There are mutinies in France. There are even mutinies in the, the British Army as um, British soldiers after the end of the war uh, demand to go home. Um, and there are um, there is a fear by David Lloyd George in 1918 and later into 1919 as well that um, violence and unrest might engulf Great Britain. So what we'll observe when we look at the, the story of Spain uh, in 1918 through to the, the mid-1920s is um, a picture that makes an overall sense in, in a European context. So, firstly, a bit of terminology for those not um, versed in Spanish history. We're going to be looking at main two main social classes, um, the, the latifunda, um, the landowners... Um, who owned the big landed estates in um, Spain, and the Yunaleros, or the landless day labourers, um, the the poorest of the the labouring classes, who um, were seen by the latifunda as being almost subhuman. Now there is an interesting um, intersection between class um, antagonisms and uh, racial ideas here. The view that the uh, Spanish landowners had was that the the poorest of the poor, the Yunaleros or Baqueros as they were also known, um, were a kind of a, almost like an untermensch. They assumed that they were not fully um, a, a European kind of um, Spaniard, um, in that the many waves of conquest and immigration into Spain during the Middle Ages uh, from um, the Middle East, from uh, the, the more invasions of Spain, and the existence up until um, the... Uh, 15th century of Jews in Spain um, had somehow tainted this lowest class of, of, of Spaniard and so they were viewed, uh, there was an interesting influx of racial ideas where you're talking about an, an ethnically homogenous group the idea that the, the landless labourers who were very much, very often burned by the sun, they were had darker, more weather-beaten features, and they were actually physically dirtier uh, a lot of the time. They were seen as, as a, a darker, browner people than the um, uh, than Spain's elites. Helped to, to foster this sense of otherness. And from a lot of the reading that I've done on the uh, condition of peasants in Europe in the early 20th century, there seems to be nothing quite like it. Even in Russia, um, following the emancipation of the serfs, there is generally, um, within the more enlightened members of the aristocracy, a spirit of paternalism. You only need to look at people like uh, Tolstoy for evidence of that. Um, the, there was a, a belief that uh, the, the peasants in Russia, the former serfs, were whilst a rough bunch, you know, something inherently good about them. 
this after 1917 uh, proves to be somewhat misguided on on the part of the uh, the, the landowners who were on mass killed by the peasants and uh, expropriated by them. But there you go. In Spain, there doesn't seem to be any, any evidence, and I could indeed be wrong. You know, this is only evidence from what I, from my own my own reading. But there doesn't seem to be any clear evidence of a uh, a latifundi. Um, paternalism uh, towards the Yonaleros um, in, in that way. Between 1918 and 1921, just as I had been between uh, 1919 and 1921 in uh, Italy, there is an explosion of unrest in the countryside um, that is uh, referred to as the, the, the three red years or the three Bolshevik years, Triennio Bolshevik. Um, the three Bolshevik years um, and it is uh, assumed by um, the landowners that the landless peasants have been influenced by the Russian Revolution and they are trying to bring about um, class warfare in the countryside the reality is probably quite different yes there were um, communist uh, parties um, at the communist party members amongst the peasantry but a great many of them were um, illiterate, they were unable to really fully engage with uh, Marxist ideas and arguments, and they were not overly interested in a um, dialectical view of history. They're interested in land and food, both of which by 1918 are in short supply. These are labourers who are hired as and when. There is some um, allowance for those labourers to go um, doing things like poaching for rabbits on the uh, uh, the land uh, of the Latifunda. Um, and this all is, um, and you know, finding, you know, scraps of food here and there. Um, but the anger that the, the landowners have when these um, uprisings are put down um, ends this, uh, any kind of largesse at all. The situation becomes much more brutal for the peasants. Uh, the the landowners view them as the enemy. Uh, whilst the peasants are still working on their land, they think that uh, really there's a popular belief that, that no cruelty um, to um, crush the uh, insubordination of the peasantry is excessive. It's interesting, actually, that the landowners are in somewhat something of decline as a result of the First World War. Neutrality had um, brought the ruling classes of Spain um, a great deal of wealth. They hadn't um, risked their fortunes in the war. And the, uh, the war was an industrial boom for uh, every neutral country, probably in the world, that had um, an industrial base. Spain's was developing very slowly, um, and the uh, ability of, of Spain to produce manufactured goods to sell overseas, and the ability of Spain to lend money, enriched her industrial and financial classes. And these classes um, were in a kind of an uneasy relationship with the landowners who traditionally been the main source of wealth and power in Spain. So the landowners felt somewhat threatened by, not just by the peasants, but by the people that they considered to be on their side, you know, their um, people with similar class interests. But from 1918 onwards, a, a solid alliance was built between industry, finance and the landowning class in order to see off the threat of Bolshevism and the threat of uh, uni unionised labour in the cities and possibly even unionised labour in the countryside. And at the disposal of the landowners and um, the uh, financial and industrial class were the civil guard, the uh, Spain's paramilitary police force, um, which was the, the rule of law in the countryside, and the army. The army crushed uh, the Communist Party in August 1917, and uh, until, up until 1923 there is a, a civil war, uh, an undeclared civil war, but a civil war nonetheless, uh, going on in the countryside. 
the civil war that begins in 1936 and had been uh, the, the, had been sort of simmering since about 1931 was really uh, in the eyes of the likes of Franco and the other generals the uh, the conclusion of unfinished business from the early 1920s. And the country is divided between north and south. In the south, largely agrarian, you have peasant uprisings. And in the north, in places like Catalonia and the Basque, um, you have uh, strikes and uh, lockouts and industrial action due to wage cuts and the um, ever-present uh, job insecurity. The reason why there are wage cuts is because Spain, like uh, everywhere else in Europe, um, faces the, uh, Im- the immediacy of, of the post-war recession. In the middle of all this is an anxious middle class. Uh, fearing the possibility of communism, the uh, lurid and very often quite real stories from Russia of the the fate of the bourgeoisie um, in every country in Europe has the middle classes feeling extremely vulnerable and anxious. And this is prime territory for the dissemination of uh, fascist ideas, um, particularly anti-Semitism. The um, popularity of anti-Semitic myths in Spain in the early 1920s is far, far greater than that of Germany in the early 1920s. Most um, German far-right nationalist anti-Semitism is kept on the fringes of acceptable discourse. Uh, Not so in Spain. There's another force that is managing to spread this very successfully. And it's an extreme form of uh, Catholicism that identified the threat of communism and the existence of Jews as uh, one and the same thing. Ironically, there really aren't any Jews in Spain. Uh, If there are, it's a tiny, tiny handful. Spain had exiled its Jews uh, many centuries beforehand in the 1400s. And so... When we talk about the influence of Catholicism, this was not a doctrine that emanated from Rome or from um, any official source of the the Catholic Church. It was uh, an extreme right-wing conspiracy theory um, that um, the progenitors of were uh, largely, almost exclusively, of the the Catholic faith, um, obviously Spain being a Catholic country, but the um, and also the the ideas stemmed from um, medieval uh, Catholic conspiracy theories. These ideas uh, of a Jewish plot against Christendom had existed in medieval Spain, and they were resurrected um, in the nineteenth century. Um, um, in order to undermine social reform and then again in the 20th century in order to um, attempt to galvanise the population um, against the threat of communism. In 1912, for example, um, the Masonic and Anti-Semitic League was founded by Jose Ignacio Abina um, with, and he was supported by 22 Spanish bishops um, who, uh, one of whom, the Bishop of Almera, wrote, Everything is ready for the decisive battle that must be unleashed between the children of light and the children of darkness, between Catholicism and Judaism, between Christ and the devil. These um, suspicions are amplified by uh, the events of 1917 in Russia um, and the belief that a kind of a, a worldwide conspiracy was uh, commencing. It's only in 1923 when General Miguel Primo de Rivera um, uh, launched a military coup and established himself as a dictator um, the, that the, kind of the anxieties of the upper and middle classes are quelled. Now a, a military strongman had presented himself in order to protect the nation from um, the threat of communism. And obviously the parallels with Germany here uh, are difficult to ignore. It just so happens 
that Spain was uh, far easier to um, seize uh, by uh, the forces of the far right far earlier than Germany was, and uh, obviously so, so was Italy. As with all uh, fascisms, Rivera uh, relied heavily on disseminating anxieties popularly and was keen to continue with the anti-Semitic, anti-communist and also anti-Freemason myths. Um, the, uh, there was a, a belief that the Freemasons were involved in the uh, sinister Jewish plot and that the Freemasons were the, almost the, the dupes of, of, of the Jews. And the um, continued uh, idea that the, this kind of Manichaean struggle between light and dark was at play in Spain, and that Spain was really involved in a, a fight to the death between uh, both sides, um, had um, a great uh, hold in Spanish society. And it meant that um, left-wing ideas in general were profoundly delegitimized um, throughout the 1920s. To be a trade unionist, a socialist or a communist was to be in the, popularly uh, seen as unpatriotic, to be seen as um, siding with the foreign other and siding against Spain. Part of the measure of Spanishness was a political one. People with the wrong political ideas um, were delegitimized as Spanish themselves. They were um, accused by the popular fascist uh, media and the uh, Rivera uh, regime as being uh, non-citizens, uh, as being uh, non-members of the, ra the, the national or perhaps even the racial body. Interestingly, however, Rivera's regime was not sufficiently draconian for the landowner's tastes. Uh, Rivera combined authoritarianism with a degree of paternalism, uh, seeing um, the long-term future of Spain as one whereby the peasants were ruled and cl um, tightly but looked after as well uh, in order to really drain the swamp of uh, revolutionary ideas. And as strategies go, it probably wasn't a bad one. However, the um, attempt to introduce egalitarianism into the army to um, ensure that promotions were earned on merit and that the hold of the landowning class over the army, whose sons very much filled the, the ranks of the army, very often without uh, any real talent, that that was reduced. This sees the army stand aside in 1931 when there is uh, the renewed elections and the um, Republican, a coalition of Republicans and socialists um, sweep to power. And under the um, rule of this new uh, left of centre government, um, Spanish fascist parties uh, and extreme nationalist parties thrived. Um, the development of um, conspiracy theories and um, the continuation of this um, relentless argument that um, Jewish Freemason and Bolshevik forces were aligning to undermine Spain um, had a fresh urgency in the eyes of Spain's middle classes. And the period from 1931 to 1933 is one of greatly amplified violence, almost all of it directed uh, uh, against the, the peasants. The new... Um, coalition, or the Republican Socialist Coalition that took power, had plans uh, to radically reform Spain, to attack the main power blocks of um, Ancien Regime Spain, the uh, Catholic Church, the army and the landowners, and to reform the laws as it related to all three. And this was, uh, in their eyes, a declaration of war. And the countdown to a real war, um, which happens five years later, begins in the spring of 1931 with the uh, new agenda uh, set by the coalition. Agrarian reform 
is the first shot fired, um, which uh, shows the landowners which way the, the the wind is blowing, and the um, the speed at which um, tensions escalate is due um, to the belief that um, a new front has opened. Um, in the war against what the landowners view as civilization itself, that Russia being the first front, Spain being the second, and that um, a, that the final battle uh, is is nigh. We need to remember the context of the early 1930s as well. The world has experienced a, a global economic slump. Spanish labourers who have been working in other countries, working in, in France, working uh, in Italy, have returned. Um, they are, the uh, number of jobless has swollen. There is violence on the left as well. The um, Spain's uh, 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 strong anarchist tradition, um, has, the anarchist parties, uh, viewed the government as being, not as being a, a revolutionary socialist government, of which they would rather like, but one which would make very little change at all and would really be kind of like a placeholder for um, capitalism uh, awaiting its return. And so there were um, violent clashes um, on, on, from the anarchist parties as well. And it was in part this disorder on the left that encouraged the right to think uh, in, you know, at that point seemingly the unthinkable of, of seizing power. The army and the uh, civil guard are largely in support of the right, though obviously in 1936 um, large sections of the army still declare for the republic and are willing to fight for it. The civil guard um, saw their role as, um, in, in some ways, almost a quasi-religious one. They uh, were outraged, along with the army, at the attempt by the uh, coalition government to break the power of the Catholic Church in Spain. And they saw it as uh, an almost sacred and moral duty to, uh, to resist this. And this is... Uh, an explanation as to some of the violence against the peasants, which eventually manifests itself in arbitrary mass killings. However, as with um, Nazi Germany, uh, particularly during the war and the invasion of Russia, the belief that the people who were being murdered were less than human, um, who were non uh, members of the national or racial body and who were uh, a kind of a, a, a Spanish equivalent of Untermensch made all this far more possible. One of the responses of the uh, landowners to agrarian reform was to starve the peasants into submission to either lock them out of their estates to refuse to plant uh, or sow any uh, crops or harvest. Um, the, the landowners felt that they could wait the peasants out or to uh, enforce 16-hour days um, and pay for eight hours, that sort of thing. Uh, and when the uh, peasants were hungry and destitute, to tell them, well, let the Republic sort it out, let them feed you. They, they, they are so much more interested in your welfare than we are. And this antagonism obviously led to unrest in the countryside and uh, attempts at reprisals by the peasantry, but the peasantry don't have the civil guard on their side uh, or any force really uh, whatsoever and invariably come off worse. OK, so I'm going to finish there. Um, thanks very much for listening. Um, if you want to... Hear more about Spain this week. Um, subscribe to the YouTube channel. You can either find me Nick Shepley or um, Explaining History. Get yourself on YouTube, subscribe to the channel, and I'll be doing some Spain updates this week. Uh, some extra free content for you. Anyway, hope you find that interesting, and I'll catch you later. All the best. Take care. Bye-bye.